Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about Nutex in long range RFID readers. And I'm going to give an example of where Nutex is successfully used today in the real world. My name is Matthias Eldon. I work as an embedded consultant with everything concerning embedded systems. I've been using Nutex for the last seven years in this project. And you can reach me there at info.matthiasi.com if you have any questions later. I will start by uh, telling you a little bit about RFID, so you know what I will be showing later. A few words about Tagmaster, the company where I have worked for 11 years, I think, developing these RFID readers. Why we selected Nutex seven years ago. A little bit about our implementation, and briefly about the bootloader that we have. It can be interesting for somebody else to use that, maybe. And finally, my Nutex wish list for the future. <laughs> so about RFID. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. <coughs> and it's a technology that uses radio waves to identify objects or track objects, objects with tags. And the system consists of readers like this one, uh, and tags like this one, in our case. The tags contain electronically stored information, such as a unique ID number on this tag. There are active tags and there are passive tags. Active tags, they have a battery on them and a radio transmitter. Passive tags, like this one, they collect all energy they need from the radio waves and uh, they don't have any radio transmitter in them. So RFID in general is available at many different frequencies. You probably recognize the two tags to the left. It's a key fob at 125 kilohertz, an access card at 13.56 megahertz. The tag I have here and the tag in the middle there, they work at around 900 megahertz. The two tags to the left, they use inductive coupling or load modulation. They have a read range of around maybe five centimeters, a few centimeters. These tags at 900 megahertz, they use radiative coupling or backscattering instead, so they get much, much longer read range, up to 10 meters with a tag like this, or up to 30 meters with a bigger tag with a better antenna, still completely passive. At higher frequencies, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, the tags are usually semi-passive, which means that they have a battery to power the electronics, but they still use backscattering to communicate back to the reader. And just a few words about backscattering, because that's a really cool technique. The reader here has a radio transmitter and a receiver, but the tag does not have any radio transmitter in it. So how does information pass from the tag back to the reader? We can compare with a flashlight and a mirror. So assume that I am a reader. I have a flashlight here. I shine light towards the mirror that reflects the light back to my eyes. So my flashlight is my transmitter, my eyes are my receiver, and the mirror is the tag. So by turning the mirror like this, so it either reflects or does not reflect, I can send a message back without having a transmitter here. Backscattering works in a very similar way. So what really happens is that a current flows through the reader antenna. The reader emits radio waves to the tag. These radio waves in turn cause a current to flow through the antenna in the tag. That current wakes up a little chip in the middle of the tag. And also the current through an antenna, that means that this antenna will radiate. So this antenna will emit radio waves all around it. Some of those are going back to the reader. That's what's called backscattering. And what this little chip does is that it, it modifies the properties of the antenna. So it basically makes the antenna good or bad, meaning that it can control how much of the received energy that is emitted and lost. So it can send back a message, like turning the mirror, if we compare with an example. The system we have here is a RAIN RFID system. RAIN RFID, that's a global standard for backscattering RFID at 860 to 960 megahertz. It's used to identify things, it's used to locate things, and it's used to authenticate things, mainly. Typical read range, up to 10 meters. Tags are often in the form of labels that can be bought on big rows, as you see on the picture there. And at the bottom, you see what the tag looks like inside. 
It's a thin metal antenna, in this case a folded dipole antenna with a little chip in the middle. Really cool, ASIC with only two pads that are used for testing and everything and functionality of course. So about Tagmaster then. Tagmaster is a Swedish company founded in 1994 with headquarters still in Sweden. Originally a company doing 2.45 gigahertz RFID. And now it's a global group of companies focusing on traffic and rail solutions for smart cities that still includes a lot of RFID but also license plate recognition cameras and radar sensors and other stuff like that. Our family of RAIN RFID readers, this kind of RFID readers, has five members and all of them use Nutex and has done so since 2013. If we go from left to right, the readers get more advanced, more features, longer read range, power over Ethernet, more external antennas, and so on. Uh, but they are still using Nutex. The two rightmost readers, they have a Linux system, a user programmable Linux system, but they still use Nutex for the real time part, the radio control, and the handling of time critical interfaces. We also have a few tags. Um, mainly for car access control in the Type Master case. Uh, so all of these tags have a unique ID number program into them, uh, and they are made in a way that they can't be copied or cloned. The windshield tag, that's like a sticker you put in the windshield of your car. Typical use case is to open a garage door at the company garage when the car approaches, for example. The headlight tag has the same functionality, except you put it on the headlight instead of the windshield. The reason for that is that some windshields are metallized with uh, some blocking film, for example, and metal blocks radio waves and it detunes the antenna in the tag. So then you have to put it outside. The ISO card tag I have here uh, is also used for vehicle access control and people access control. So in a car you just put it in a holder in the windshield. For people access control you put it in a lanyard around your neck. Typical use case for that is in shops to open these high-speed roll-up doors to the warehouse, for example. And these tags are just a microscopic share of all the tags that are available out there. Um, there are tags for everything from clothes to trains to anything. And since RAIN RFID is a standard, all tags that you can purchase can be read by all RAIN RFID readers. Some examples of where this system is used. Parking is one main use case, and this is a parking garage in uh, Norway. You can see readers mounted under the roof. So there is one reader above <coughs> the plane, and customers with prepaid tags on their cars, they don't have to stop and pay, they just uh, approach when the barrier opens. Very convenient. In Sweden, it's used a lot for rail also. We have RFID readers like this along the tracks. Every red spot there on the map of Sweden corresponds to a uh, location with RFID readers. Then there are tags on the train cars, so the transport authority can keep track of where they are and when they pass a certain point. And the identity information is also combined with other systems like wheel flat detection systems and pantograph uh, damage monitoring systems. Of course, uh, they can save a lot of money by detecting problems before they cause any real disaster. And the latest uh, application area for Tag Masters RAIN RFID readers is road tolls. This is a road toll outside Delhi in India, uh, where you can maybe see the readers exactly like this one are mounted. Uh, or one over each lane, so it's about 10 readers there or running Nutex, they are communicating with each other over Ethernet and use algorithms to, to remove uh, reads from adjacent lanes and things like that. And I say that the important thing here is that a system like this needs to be operating 24-7 because you don't want to close a lane on an Indian highway during rush hour. That's a really bad idea. And the option to let vehicles pass without paying is not acceptable either. 
So the readme, the system readme has to work, and Notex uh, delivers here. It really works. Mm -hmm. So why did we select Notex? Then? <coughs> Going back to 2013, our existing RFID reader platform was getting old. That was from 2005, an embedded Linux platform. The radio module we were using was approaching end of life. A large part of the main board was occupied by a legacy RF interface that we didn't need anymore. The Linux system was getting old. Memories and uh, CPU speed tends to be bad after a few years. So customers wanted bigger memories, more performance. And also the user requirements started to diverge. So most users, they just want a simple reader that's easy to connect. They don't care at all about the Linux system. Some users only use one or two interfaces. We have a lot of interfaces there, you can see. Relays and outputs, inputs, Ethernet, 232, 485, micro SD. Then we still have the power users that write their own applications running on the reader that wants the Linux system and they wanted a bigger Linux system. So it's hard to fulfill the requirements with a single product. We set out to develop a new, more scalable architecture. The, the reader in the middle is the mainstream reader that works for most customers. It's actually this one. So we decided to develop our own RF system. Uh, we based it around the Cortex-M4 microcontroller, an STM32, and we needed to keep all the interfaces for backwards compatibility. Uh, then it's possible to go to the left to just remove the <coughs> interfaces to create a cheaper model, and go to the right by adding an embedded Linux system. And in this case we moved some of the standard interfaces, the serial ports, USB, Ethernet, to the Linux system, so customers could access that. Makes sense. When the hardware architecture was set, we needed to find an operating system for the microcontroller. And one big input to this was that we had a lot of Linux code to reuse from the old platform. About eight years of development that we did not want to throw away. The existing software architecture looked like this. So on top of the Linux kernel, we had a kernel driver handling the radio control and the time critical interfaces. On top of that, we had a daemon with a TCP interface, working like a multiplexer, so multiple applications can access the reader at the same time. And on top of that, we had a shared library that was used by all applications. So all these existing applications, they are depending on the shared library, but they are also depending on the Linux APIs for networking and uh, serial ports and uh, other, other stuff. So it would be really nice to reuse applications and kernel driver as much as possible. And we came up with a wish list. We would like it to be open source because we had good experience of open source from previous projects. It had to be available for the STM32. It should be as close to Linux as possible. We needed drivers for the serial ports, Ethernet, microSD, USB, basic networking support, TCP and UDP, and a web server of some kind for the web interface. We looked around and Nantex seemed really to be the perfect fit. But there were doubts, I must admit, because there was no big organization behind it. There was no big user group that we could find, and the future seemed a bit unclear. However, uh, the fit was too good to just throw it away, so we decided to make a prototype and um, after a few days, we had uh, the reader you see in the picture here. Uh, basic but complete RFID reader running Nutex. So we decided to go for it. A few words about our implementation before I uh, try to demo it. Let's see how that goes. We decided to create a single board for each reader to make it more robust and uh, cheaper. So these are two examples from the five products we have. Uh, the one to the left is the board in this reader. It's the mainstream reader with only the microcontroller and Nutex. It's from 2013. The right one is our top model from last year with both Nutex and Linux. Uh, 
in addition to the Linux system, it has a lot of radio improvements as well, longer read range and more configurable antennas and other nice things. And all of those improvements are handled by the NUTX system. So Linux is just like just like a computer where users can code. All, all the real things are done by NUTX in that reader as well. <laughs> Uh, we modified the software architecture a bit to suit uh, the microcontroller better. <coughs> so the Linux kernel driver, we ported that to NUTX. That was fairly straightforward. Uh, the concepts are very similar. So we removed the user mode daemon because we didn't want the sockets handling in the microcontroller. So instead the multiplexing functionality was moved into the driver. We ported the shared library and changed it to talk directly to the driver. And then the applications were basically recompiled as Nutex tasks. Uh, very nice with this POSIX compliance. The daemon, uh, we created a new application that implemented the same functionality as the daemon to make it possible to, to connect using TCP with the same protocol as uh, used on the previous readers. And in the readers with both Nutex and Linux, uh, the Linux system communicates with the NUTX system using onboard USB. All the applications on the reader and the web interface compiles from exactly the same code, even if it runs on NUTX or if it runs on Linux. And the microcontroller binary is exactly the same in both systems. So in the left one, which is this one, is a complete reader running NUTX. In the right one, the NUTX binary uh, handles the radio control and uh, time critical interfaces. All serial ports and standard interfaces are moved to the Linux system in this case. I'm going to try a demo. <laughs> so I'm connected to this reader using an Ethernet cable. And we have a web interface here. Looks like this. This is actually done using the micro IP example in the NUTX apps directory. If I did this today, I would probably have chosen another more powerful <laughs> solution. Uh, but we, we started with that and we have modified the web server slightly to add authentication and HTTP posts to be able to save and restore settings and made a fixed uh, a version with a fixed number of threads, for example, to make it robust. It works very well now. And uh, in this web interface, it's possible for the user to configure settings. Uh, you can look, for example, here. We have all the interfaces, Ethernet. <coughs> so we have, typically, they use a serial port. They can select which protocol to use. These are access control protocols that are used by different manufacturers. And um, yeah, they can save settings. Mm -hmm. Then we can read tags, of course. Uh, let's switch on. Something I can switch on read B. We have the read range is at maximum now. I'll tag here. Switch on the read B, which means that it beeps when it reads a tag. <coughs> we go to the read tag page. Clear it. So I have the tag here. I can just read it. And you can see that it reads mm -hmm. up to 10 meters uh, away. You can see there the ID number, and that's also printed on the tag. So it actually reads that and counts how many times it reads. Uh, let's hide the tag, or maybe switch off and read it. <laughs> uh, it's also possible to connect with uh, C reports or everything. We can connect with TCP IP just to show an example. So one of the protocols is called Tag P. Um, that's a text based protocol. So I have to write, oh, hello, tag P. Like that with the version. Then you can see that I get events uh, like text strings when I read. So this is one way the users can connect to a simple reader. I can. Uh, Send commands to the reader to make it read, for example, things like that. Uh, I want to show one last thing, and that is not done with NUTX, but to make this system user friendly, 
it is very important for our customers to be able to upgrade firmware in a safe and easy way. So we looked for good solutions for that and didn't find one. So we implemented a bootloader that I will show. Maybe it can be interesting to somebody else. We go to reboot upgrade and click start bootloader like this. The reader starts into a bootloader that is always available in the first sector in the flash, so it can't be erased. It will always be there if something fails. And it has a web interface, so you can just choose a file and click upgrade. And the file is downloaded to the reader and reflashed and the bootloader is safe. So if I unplug the power during the upgrade, it's still possible to, to save the reader for the customer. It also has a fail safe environment where all user settings are stored. So they are also kept during the upgrade. Just remove it again. And we should get back to the reader. I'll go back to the presentation again. Just a few words about this bootloader. Uh, as I said, we didn't find a good solution. So if anybody is interested in a bootloader, uh, send me a mail later, we can probably make it available. Uh, it's invisible during normal start. It does a public key verification of the firmware, so it checks an RSA certificate, um, signature of the firmware before it starts it. It has a web interface, as you saw. It also has this fail-safe environment for settings and a very small footprint, around 12k bytes. You can start the bootloader either as I did, or if everything has crashed, you can set the dip switch to force the bootloader to start. Uh, it also starts if the RSA signature doesn't match, so if there's something wrong with the firmware. The reason for that is that we don't want customers to download firmware that can read out sensitive things from the flash. The only way now they can download signed firmware, and they can mass erase the whole chip. That's the only way things they can do. But normally, the the bootloader is completely uh, invisible. You saw the web interface. The fail safe environment is also interesting. It stores settings, just like normal environment variables. So everything that is configured in the web interface is stored in this environment. <coughs> it's shared between the bootloader and the firmware, so the bootloader can access IP address settings, for example. And it keeps the settings when the firmware is upgraded. It's also done in a way that it guarantees that values are either completely written or not written at all. If the power is uh, unplugged during the write, for example. And the only thing it requires are two erasable flash sectors with single byte write capability, which is quite typical for microcontrollers. In our case, we have the bootloader in the first small 16K sector of the SM32 and the environment in the following two. So these sectors are never overwritten when upgrading firmware. Okay, the last slide then, my NAPX wish list. I tried to come up with a long wish list, but I didn't. So it's, it's really very small. It has a one main bullet point, and that is to let NAPX continue to be this Linux on a microcontroller thing that it is. Uh, that has been the main point for us. We have not needed so much of the real-time stuff, really. We have needed the POSIX compliance on the microcontroller. And I think there are so many Linux developers out there that are familiar with Linux. So by using the similar APIs to Linux as often as possible, we make it easy for all these developers to use NUTX and even more importantly to, to choose to use NUTX. It's a natural step for them to choose that. That's important, I think. The second bullet point is not that important. It was so that when we started to develop this, uh, we looked at the features that <coughs> were not there in NUTX. Uh, for us, it became a way to differentiate our products. So some features are only available in the Linux readers. For example, the ones I mentioned here. Uh, discovery protocols, such as universal plug-and-play, multicast DNS, DNS service discovery. Those are the protocols that make a network device show up in Windows Explorer and in the Safari browser and Macintosh computers. Uh, very nice to have. 
Secure network protocols would be good, of course. TNS, HTTPS, network time protocol. I know that uh, many of these things are available on the internet and we can download and compile them. We choose not to do that at the time. Uh, so to summarize that point, I think that's the most important point for me. Let NutX continue to be Linux on a microcontroller and the POSIX compliance has been very important for us. And also feel free to use these slides as an example if you need to convince a manager that NutX <laughs> can be used out there. It's, mm -hmm. It is really used and has been for at least seven years in these products, working extremely well. And um, thank you for listening. You mentioned that you use the uh, HTTP server from the apps directory. Yeah. Did you also put back the improvements? Uh, actually, we haven't done that. I have thought about doing that. <laughs> okay. Just because of time. Okay. I don't know. Is anybody using that? The the micro IP web server in the apps directory? I, I would be, yes. Yeah. So then it, it would make sense. I thought maybe nobody's using it because it's very basic uh, in the beginning. So that, that yeah. came from UIP and was even more basic before people out here from extending it. Yeah, yeah. There's also a, a, a TH, HTTPD. That's also available as an example. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's actually got a really nice, uh, uh, I forgot the word, CLI? Uh, no. CGI? CGI, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so I, I would probably have used that. If I, if I would do this again today, I would have used that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much a full feature. It's not, it's not used as much, so it's probably not as mature. I think you probably have to do some maturing. Yeah. The, the thing with the, the UIP web server example is that it does not require any file system, virtual file it's system it's for CGI scripts. It's more like <coughs> function calls. Uh, uh, so so it, it, for really small systems, I think it may, it may be useful. And I can, I can put those changes uh, back also. That would be great. Uh, you, on your, your wish list, you had NTP. Yeah. Is SNTP be enough? Uh, the network time. It's protocol. a simple network time. Yeah. Protocol. It's uh, not not as not as well blown. It it has slightly more jitter, things like that. But it would work. Maybe I don't know exactly the requirements. Any more questions? Because I recommend we have a quick break for coffee before we do the next one. So uh, thank you very very much. Really interesting stuff. Thank you.